Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church. Uh, we're in the study of the book of Acts. If you remember, we've been, this is number 50, so we've been in this study for quite a while. We're up to chapter 15. And uh, I pray as, you're, as we've been studying through this, as you see the how things develop. Uh, you know, it wasn't, the founding of the church was not an easy thing. We see the back at Pentecost, in, you know, in chapter 2, when Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit came down, we've seen all the things that happened, but as we've been progressing through, we saw a lot of, there's been some peaks and valleys for the church and some challenges for the church and, and some victories along with that. So uh, we've been looking at uh, getting into the missionary trips a little bit now, getting to the starting of some churches, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. But uh, this contention or this um, controversy, this controversy come up about why it took to be saved, what, it, what really was involved with salvation. And, and that's kind of where we've been at for the last couple of weeks. Uh, here in chapter 15 because there's others that taught uh, different kinds of doctrines. So that's what we're going to look at and see some of those other kind of doctrines that uh, kind of infiltrate the church today and get and get in the way. Uh, it causes stumbling block, cause people to uh, wonder what what is the truth. Uh, one church to say uh, this is what salvation is, another church to say this is what salvation is. And, and uh, the idea is that uh, if there's not, they're not together. So denominations make a big difference and it doesn't take a lot. Uh, a lot of, in fact, most uh, false doctrines uh, are probably 90% accurate. Uh, it's just that uh, one part they get into, that one part that's not right, and so they add to uh, the gospel. And we're going to talk about that too. So we're in chapter 15, and we're going to start off in verse 22, and then we'll see how far we can get here this evening. We know that they've been they've been in Jerusalem. They had the Council of Jerusalem, and. Uh, uh, it's trying to determine what the gospel was, what the truth was. And so we get over here to chapter 22, uh, verse 22, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 22. Then pleased it uh, the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And, and namely, they're going to send uh, uh, Barsabbas and uh, Silas. Okay, Judas named, surnamed Barsabbas and Silas. So they're going to send uh, these, what they call them, chief men. They're, they're kind of the esteemed. They're kind of some leaders in the church there. And so Paul and Barnabas, we know they came from Antioch to Jerusalem to settle this question about what, what, is, uh, what is the plan of salvation, what does it take to be saved. And uh, so they're going back to Antioch with the, with the results of this meeting. We've seen up there in the last few verses of the chapter 15 there in verses like 28, 20, or 18, 19, 20, along there, what they required. This is what the Church of Jerusalem is requiring. So uh, they're going to go back and they're going to send Silas, like I said, and Judas with them. And so they have the letter now, so in verse 23, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. So what they did was just, they write in this letter, it says, The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. So we see, uh, the, when we see the type of people that sent this letter, we see that they're the apostles, which would be like, considered more or less the elite, the elders are the other leaders in the church, and then he talks about the brethren. And those are just uh, just like you and I, just common, ordinary members of the church. Workers in the church have things to do, but we're not, we hold, don't hold a high office. And so they're, but they all came together, and this letter's from all of them. So we know there's a unity there, and uh, there's no uh, ranking. We're actually, the apostles and, and the elders, they didn't say, well, you know, it's going to be our way or not. Uh, they brought the whole church in, if you remember, we talked about last week, and they all got together and had their input. And they had they could have the controversy and they hashed it out. But that's, see, that's how a church is supposed to do it. It's not supposed to uh, get in and one one party, you know, they get their way, and if you don't like it, you can leave. No, the idea is a body of Christ. We need to come together, and there is going to be some dissension. There's going to be some questions about what we should do and what we shouldn't do, as far as the church is concerned. And, and so we want to be sure that we just just come together. We can come to an understanding. There's give and take, and when we get, uh, especially in different areas, but you know, when it comes to the gospel, there can't be no give and take. There's only one gospel, as we're going to see. So they they came together, sending this letter now uh, to the to the churches and uh, over in Antioch, and we're going to see what they're going to have. I just a note I made here that when we look at the word uh, brethren, um, the the word brethren has the idea of, of being uh, of the same womb. This means that you're just you're blood brothers, basically, you know, they're the same family. And he says uh, in verse 24, that says, For as much as we have heard, that certain which, was, which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised, and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So if we, we back up in this uh, 
same chapter in verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse number 1, he says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, I remember these are leaders in the church, they taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're coming to the Gentiles and say, You know what? you you got to be circumcised now. So faith in Christ plus circumcision. So we drop on down to verse number 5 in the same chapter. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, there's another group now, another, if we could say, denomination, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So we see uh, one group saying, you know, you've got faith in Christ plus circumcision. And we go a little bit further to a different group of the Pharisees here, and they said, well, yeah, faith in Christ plus circumcision, and you've got to keep the law. So see how, how it all adds. And so these the Gentiles are down there now over in Antioch, and Paul has been there, and he's been preaching one gospel. And then these others come in in verse uh, 1 in chapter 15. They add to what Paul said. And then another group comes down in verse 5. They add to what the other group said. So you see how this is getting all distorted. And, and uh, so the confusion reigns there. It says the word uh, troubled you. He said uh, they, they've agitated, disturbed, they've upset you, you know, because the idea is what if you're not saved, what's your destination? You know, if you're not saved, you're going, you're headed for hell. You're not going to heaven when you die. So your salvation is key. And so I'm getting these these people are just new Christians. They just got saved. Then we had we saw the revival there that took place, and and a lot of people got saved. Now you know a week later they all come to church. The Gentiles did. We see all these things going on, and now we get this other teaching. So they're confused. And so what's happening is they're starting to doubt, what well, am I saved or am I not saved? What is truth? And we see that today. What is truth? What is the true gospel? What is the true way of salvation? So not only that, they subverted, we see right there, he says, um, they troubled you with words, uh, subverting your souls. The idea of subverting means to plunder, to devastate, to dismantle. So what they're doing, they're, they're tearing down their belief system. They're tearing down what they believed was necessary for salvation. They're tearing that apart. So we see that there's there's nothing, though, that can be added to the gospel. I'm going to go over to, we're going to go over to Galatians here for a moment. So if you want to take your Bibles, if you're following along, go to Galatians chapter 1. In the verses 6 to 9, and Paul addresses this. Uh, the churches of Galatia, uh, this is a, Galatia is a region. And uh, as we've studied prior to, remember Paul was stoned. And, and so we see that uh, Derby and Lystra and Iconium and others were in this area of Galatia. And so these people are being influenced by these false teachers. So we get over to Galatians. And this is probably the first uh, letter that Paul wrote. And in verse, uh, chapter number 1, in verse 6 to 9, he says, I marvel, or I'm astonished, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, which is another gospel or a different gospel. He said, I, I, it's amazing to me that you're, you're, you're changing, which is not another, but there will be some that trouble you. And we looked at that back over here in Acts, that trouble you and would, would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's what they were doing when they was adding circumcision, when they was adding the law. Uh, they was perverting the gospel of Christ. In other words, they was making it of non-effect. Verse 8 says, But though we, listen, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. They said, anybody comes with anything other than what we preach here, let him be cursed. As I said before, verse 9, so I say, I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. So Paul's saying, you know what, uh, let them be a curse on them if they bring anything else because it's a false gospel. People that are believing the false gospel are condemned. They're not saved. You can't add to the gospel of Christ. I'm going over into chapter 3. And we'll look at a few verses in chapter 3, uh, starting in, in uh, verse number 1 here in Galatians. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath, hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only will I learn of you. Paul says, you know, just clear this up for me. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He said, go back, go back to your day of salvation. How did you get saved? Was it, was it by the spirit, by the works of the law, uh, the circumcision, the, the uh, being obeyed in the law of Moses, or was it by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect or complete by the flesh? In other words, you started in the spirit. Is that not the beginning and the end? You're saying that uh, you started in the spirit. Now, does it take something else to get you saved? He said, are you so foolish to believe that? You, you're made perfect by circumcision and the law? He says, no. 
He said, having suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain, are you, have you been suffering for your faith for nothing? Are you, you weren't saved? Are you already been suffering for nothing? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth that he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And we can go on through that chapter, but I just wanted to just to show you uh, what Paul has to say to these churches. And these are the churches he just founded churches in, uh, in Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And so he said, he said that you're drifting from the gospel. What is wrong with you? You stay, be awakened. So we see this letter being sent to the church at Antioch from Jerusalem. And this is to set it straight. This is to help them understand that this is the truth. Okay, the church of Jerusalem, that was the, we call it, quote unquote, the mother church. That's where the apostles basically uh, come out of. He says, uh, so be it, pay attention now and then don't get caught up in all this teaching over in, you know, down in verse 25 here in the 15th chapter of Acts. He said, it seemed a good unto us being assembled with one accord, they were in unity, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So it's what he's saying is that for the church of Jerusalem, he said, you know what, we're going to send a couple of the guys with them. Beloved, Paul and Barnabas are special to them. Okay, they're the beloved ones. And he said, that we're going to send a couple extra with you with Barnabas. And these men that they're going to send that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they put their life on the line. They, they was willing to go out and put their life on the line. And, you know, when you stop and think about this little testimony we see here, I read about it all the time in the Voice of the Martyrs where Christians around the world are putting it on the line for, uh, put their life right on the line for Christ. They won't deny Christ. And he said, these men have went out and they put their life on the line. So when we look today, what would we be willing to do? How far, how far are you willing to, to go in your uh, commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to fulfilling the Great Commission. Are you willing to go so far as to put your life on the line that, you know, uh, imprisonment? If you go any farther, you know, if you say any more about it, if you do anything, you have a Bible. Are you willing to go to prison to have a Bible? Are you willing to go to prison to be able to witness, to be able to teach and preach the Word of God? Are you willing to do it? And he said, these guys that they're going to send with them, he said, they, they, they've laid it all out there. Uh, they're willing to risk their lives for the gospel of Christ. And I think that one of the things, when we truly understand the value of salvation, we, we don't, we, we talk about heaven, we talk about hell, we talk about being saved, but I don't really think we understand the judgment of God against sinners. God is a holy God, completely separated from sin. There cannot be any sin in God's presence. No sin will be in heaven. No sin is going to leave this earth in the rapture. None. God is perfectly holy. And we don't understand that. So we think that, well, we can do things and, and that it's not important. Oh, so what if you have uh, baptism added to salvation? Well, that's saying that the work of Christ wasn't enough. He didn't complete it for him. So, uh, again, we get these additions. We see it today. Uh, like communion, baptism, you know, Christ plus. Uh, this a, a simple thing. I hear this a lot. It said, you have to hang on. Okay, you put your faith in Christ and you have to hang on. That's adding to the gospel. And see, that's not a gospel. That's, that's, there's only one gospel. The gospel means the good news. There's only one good news. So when people say, you know, well, you get saved by faith and you hang on. No, that's saying that man has a part to play and man has no part to play. The only part that man has to play is the repentance part. We hear the gospel. We turn from our sin. We turn to God and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing his blood paid the price for our sins. We trusting in that completely. From our heart, not from our head, but from our heart. And I'm going to put my faith and trust. So all these other things, church membership, uh, communion, uh, baptism, hanging on, doing anything else, it, it, it removes the gospel. There is no gospel in it. There's no good news because Jesus did it all. Man can't do anything. All these other things is man trying to do something to help God save him, to help him be righteous in the eyes of God. And we know there's only one way we can be righteous in the eyes of God. That's when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we are never righteous, but when we come to know Christ, we're clothed in his righteousness. So all these things, it's, it's like, you know, it's like you, you're going to make a profession of faith, so you're going to be clothed in Christ's righteousness, and communion is going to tear it off, or our baptism is going to tear it off. Or, no, 
It can't happen. It's, it's only one gospel. And that's what and they're all caught up with. They're saying, you know, that they have to understand that this is the truth, the only truth. And so we see here that he's saying that these men hazarded it. They put their life on the line. And we see what they're, they're trying to do. Here we go a little bit further. He said in verse 27, We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same thing by mouth. So they're, they're sending the letter, but these two guys are coming along, and they're going to they're gonna articulate it. They're going to put it out there, verbalize it, and just uh, preach it and teach it uh, when they get here to Antioch. So it seems that, and we go to verse 28 now, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. So we see this, the Holy Ghost moving in them. They're, they're praying about it. And they, feel, they feel God moving through the Holy Ghost. It says it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And here's, here's the rules, okay? Here's the rules that they have, that you abstain from meats. We talked about that last week. Offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Uh, fare ye well. So what he's saying is that uh, it, you're going to do these things. These are these are rules now, okay? Uh, but they're not rules for salvation. These are rules to live by. You're saved, okay? He says, you're now saved, so here's what you need to do as a result of your salvation. Not to get you saved, not to keep you saved, not to do any other part of your salvation. It's an evidence of your salvation that you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you'll do it. You're going to have a good life. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to have those things evidence in your life. So when they were, so when they were dismissed, Okay, so they have the council. They got the letter all written out. They're going to take it to them. So when they were dismissed, uh, Paul and Barnabas and, and Silas and Judas there, uh, they came to Antioch. And listen, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. Okay, they came. Hey, here's, here's the letter. And they read it. And look at the result. Which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation, for the exhortation. He said, wow, we're not under the law. We don't have to worry about the law of Moses. It's not that we shouldn't be obedient to God's rules and God's laws and God's commandments, but we're, it's not part of our salvation. We don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to have this. So they rejoiced. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They, they're, they're preaching up a storm. Uh, these two men that come with Paul and Barnabas, uh, they're preaching up a storm and, and they're getting people are getting encouraged. And he says here, with many words and confirmed them, after they had tarried there a space, uh, they were let go in peace from the brethren until the apostles. So, okay, so the, the people that came down to, from Jerusalem, he said, after they've been there a while, they've been preaching and teaching and leading people to the Lord. He said, then they're going to go home. But I, I noticed in verse 34, he said, notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. In other words, Silas has come from Jerusalem with Paul and Barnabas and, and uh, Judas there and others. And so they come down there and he says, it pleased Silas to abide there still. And so the question comes to my mind, well, why did Silas want to stay? I mean, I guess probably, you know, the excitement. Uh, there's things happening there. Maybe back in Jerusalem it's a little bit more subtle. There's not as much excitement. You know, people at the church ain't like with the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles, all of a sudden they found out they can be saved by faith and faith alone. And so they're all excited about that. And so maybe it pleases But I think another thing is that we're going to see here, and uh, we'll get to next week when we get down to verses 36 to 41, that Silas plays into the picture. It's God's hand at work. Silas is going to be there because he's going to be needed. He's going to be needed, and we'll see what that all amounts to. But see, as you, as you look at Scripture and we study it, we need to see how God molds it and makes it and how it all fits together. It's like a puzzle, and all the pieces go together make a, a perfect picture. And that's what we're seeing here. Just a little glimpse of it as we see why Silas decided, hey, I'm going to stay. I'm not going to go. I want to stay here in Antioch. And Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So there's other people preaching and teaching. This is a movement. This isn't something just a, a one-man show. This is a movement that's going on. The church is growing. The church is expanding. People are coming to know the Lord. And there's a lot of excitement, especially in the Gentile community. Hey, all of a sudden, we're getting, they're getting involved in all this. From the time that Peter went to Cornelius, there's been a, a movement there. And we see and now it's really going to explode. Paul and uh, Barnabas went on their first missionary trip. We saw what happened. Of course, Paul got stoned for his efforts there. But the idea is that God uh, took care of him. So they're back in Antioch. So now we, we got the plan of salvation, and it is back over here in uh, chapter 15, verse 11. But if we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. 
That's the whole thing. Faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing that He is who He said He is. He is the Son of God. He is the perfect sacrifice. He went to the cross. He shed His precious blood on Calvary's cross as payment for our sin. When I believe that, not with my head, not with my mouth, but with my heart, I'm trusting that completely. No baptism, no circumcision, no hanging on, nothing else. It's Christ and Christ alone. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is the day. This is the hour. Back here we just read how the Gentiles are rejoicing. They got saved by faith and faith alone. They don't have to worry about all these other things to go through. They're just by putting their faith and trust in Christ, they have eternal life. And you can have that today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can be saved today. I don't care what you've done. As far as your spiritual uh, aspects, what God can do for you, you know, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, uh, you're not beyond the reach of God. He can bring you, if you'll just confess your sin, turn to Him. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to die for my sin. But I'm trusting, I'm believing with all my heart that Jesus has already paid the price. I'm trusting His shed blood as payment for my sins. Forgive me and save me. Use your own words, but it's all about the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you again for your love for us and how you take care of us day by day. And as we, we look at these portions of Scripture, we see how the, there's confusion, there's things that go on, Lord, but we know that uh, you're faithful and we thank you for your word. And we just we just trust your word. We know it's your word and you cannot lie. So those that don't know Christ, we pray if there be someone watching today that does not know Jesus as a personal Savior, that this would be the day. That this would be the hour that the power of the Holy Spirit would move on them and that convicting power would come into their life and they would uh, can hum humble themselves and turn and put their faith and trust in Jesus. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for that plan of salvation and your son that paid the price. And we just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.